Huh? Huh? Hi, Dr. Joel. Welcome to Many Questions, the show where we ask each guest many questions about mental health and mental health research. How are you doing today? Hi, I'm really well, thank you. Very happy to be here and thanks for having me. So I guess going like back to basics, what is anxiety? So anxiety is an inbuilt and evolved emotional response, which is designed to keep yourself in danger. In terms of how we perceive it, anxiety, it's that butterflies in your stomach, sense of unease and worry. So it's, it's almost this physical sensation and there's lots of different markers. So we might experience an elevated heart rate or muscle tension or even blurred vision, panic attacks. They're all on this spectrum of anxiety. But fundamentally where anxieties come from is this evolutionary response to keep us safe from danger. So our brains have evolved over time, but anxiety has been there since pretty much the beginning. So we start with this little bit of our brain in the middle and I'm going to try and do it as a model. <laughs> so imagine your thumbs uh, at this bit of uh, your brainstem that you kind of started with back in the day, millions of years ago. And mm. this is where anxiety lives. Um, it's our emotional control center, but it's also the bit which deals with things like our heart rate and our breathing rate, and the really fundamental bits of stuff which keep us alive. And back in the day, this was kind of all we needed to keep ourselves safe from danger. So when we came across danger, say tigers, bears, lions, other tribe members who wants to kick us out of the tribe, not particularly pleasant things, yeah. um, it kicks off this anxiety response. So it gets us ready to let's get away from stuff so yeah, lets us fight stuff so dangerous it lets us fight it's also got a freeze response in building as well which could be really helpful um so if there's a predator for a couple of fields away and if you ran away it's going to see you if you ran towards it you're going to lose a fight against the lion so sometimes it's really helpful for us to just stay stock still do nothing and freeze and find our, rest, uh, our next move and that's what anxiety is it's this really inbuilt intrinsic danger response and that's why it's unpleasant. Mm -hmm. It tells us there's something unpleasant going on. We need to get away from it. Now, what's happened over time is we've got this really clever bit of cortex and brain, which is formed on top of it. And hopefully that looks a bit more like a brain. It but does. It's, this, it's this clever bit over the top which lets us think and plan and worry and imagine danger. And these days, our brain responds to not just the physical dangers around us, but our imagined dangers as well. So worrying about the future. What if I've not uh, got the right ingredients to cook for my partner tonight? And what if I've got a a podcast and I say the wrong thing or mess up my words so that sense of social anxiety of being judged which are really important modern day dangers but also stuff like sitting in traffic some modern stresses and strains have also changed from the things we'd have been experiencing millions of years ago so we've kind of got these two parts of anxiety we've got the original kind of inbuilt danger response which is still exactly the same and that clashes with both our current environment and our and the clever bit of our brain which has formed over the next couple of million years and that's our felt sense of anxiety today so that clash the really clever danger response which is brilliant for us and sometimes that interferes with the modern environment we know people were to say like i had a funny feeling about this would you say that's that kind of area of the brain telling them that yeah exactly that so it's, it's this alert signal and anxiety is deliberately and designed to be uncomfortable if it was really easy and nice we wouldn't notice it if we got this warm rush of um, endorphins and lovely feelings every time we saw uh, a bear or You'd run right to it <laughs> or having a fight. yeah we'd run right towards it right and we wouldn't have as human beings survive very long. So generation after generation after generation of evolution, we've got really good at feeling uncomfortable. It's, it's got really good at making us uncomfortable. So it's that, it's, it's that full spectrum of a general sense of unease and we can't quite put our finger on it. It's a full-blown panic attack where it feels like we're having a spike in anxiety, we're going to pass out. It's a huge rush of adrenaline. It can feel like we're having a heart attack. So that's where anxiety operates right along that spectrum. Saying that, when does it become harmful? So when does anxiety become an anxiety disorder? So an anxiety becomes an anxiety disorder when it's having a functional day-to-day -day impact on us, mm -hmm. which is a fancy way of saying it's restricting or dictating our lives. So it's stopping us doing the things that we fundamentally want to do and bring us meaning as human beings. It means we develop coping strategies to help us cope with the anxiety, but those things have a time cost or they have a cost of the sorts of stuff that we want to do. It might be that we're spending so much time planning for an event that we're four hours late to it, as an example. Mm -hmm. It might be that we have to have to have our sat-nav there every time we want to go on a journey because we're anxious about going the wrong way. Mm -hmm. But then the one day we don't have our sat-nav, it means that we have a panic attack because we're not used to doing it without it. So it restricts our life. And it's when we can't stop or control the worrying. So worrying is a really fundamental part of being a human being. So worrying and planning aren't that far removed from each other. When worrying starts to impact us is where we can't stop or control it. So we've got a really fast mind. Thoughts are constantly going around in our heads and we can't switch them off. And it's taking us out of the present moment. So we might be doing the stuff that we want to be doing, but mm -hmm. we're not really in it. 
Yeah. What we're actually thinking about is, have I left the taps on? What am I going to make for tea? Have I said the right thing? Is this person judging me? So we're kind of in the thing, but we're not fully in it. We're not connected with it. We're not having this genuinely important human connected experience to whatever we're doing. Our attention is focused internally rather than externally. And it's doing that to a degree where it's having a meaningful impact on our day-to-day lives and it's restricting us. How common is, is an anxiety disorder? Oh, that's a really good question. <laughs> and I'm not going to give you a straight answer. Mental health diagnoses aren't things that we can measure objectively, that there's no test we can do for anxiety disorder. We can't see anything in a blood test or a brain scan. We don't have an objective measure of what the anxiety is. So we have to go by people's lived experience and we compare that to a big long list of criteria of what different anxiety disorders might be. There's loads of overlap, so those symptoms crop up in lots of different anxiety disorders, so it's quite difficult to fit people into which category best fits them. And people's experiences shift over time as well, all the time. So when we're talking about how common anxiety is, the prevalence is 100%. Everyone pretty much on the planet has anxiety. And that line of what tips someone over into having an anxiety disorder isn't black and white. And someone might be one side of that spectrum on one day and not quite on the other day. So actually, when we're talking about what that looks like, it's almost meaningless to give a percentage and then different types of anxiety disorder would vary anyway. So the long and short of it is I wouldn't feel comfortable giving you an estimate because it's such a common and important human experience. And that it doesn't feel like there's enough nuance to justify it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that's fair. I do think that's fair. What are some of the more like more prevalent types of anxiety disorders? So I think the first thing to say, so anxiety isn't a diagnosis, Mm -hmm. um, although that's the one which is most common. um, And actually this comes into the confusion of diagnosis and people not knowing if they've been diagnosed and what with them, what that means. Mm -hmm. And there's no reason they should really, because it's never explained particularly well. Um, So what most people are referring to when we say anxiety is generalised anxiety disorder. And this is really defined as excessive worry. So we can't stop or control worrying. We tend to worry about worry, so I'm worrying too much and going crazy. Mm. Why can't I stop worrying? We've got panic disorder. So panic attack itself is this really distressing experience, which can feel similar to heart attacks, that we have an intense burst of physical symptoms of anxiety, which is a mismatch between your anxiety response, getting you ready to react to danger, and you actually just being sat at your desk. So our heart rate really spikes, our breathing rate spikes because our body's expecting us to run away from something. But because we're sitting still, there's this mismatch. What tends to happen is we become really attuned to the normal changes in our body, which precede the panic attacks, because that's what's happening. It's the increase in elevation in these anxiety symptoms, which culminate in a panic attack. But then these panic attacks become triggered because we become hypersensitive to looking subconsciously or consciously for the changes in our body. So these panic attacks can feel like they come out of absolutely nowhere. But what's actually happening is our body is, and brain is recognizing these minute physical changes in our body, which it does day to day to keep us in a state of homeostasis. And we get these really intense short bursts of anxiety where it feels like we're having a heart attack and those are terrifying so we get really good at avoiding stuff which triggers them like exercise confined situations but what we're doing is we're avoiding the triggers for the panic attacks itself and how frequent are some of these panic attacks for someone who does have panic disorder it completely varies Mm -hmm. so actually what you might find is there's someone with panic disorder who isn't having any panic attacks at all because they've got so good at avoiding every situation possible which might trigger a panic attack so the coping strategy of avoiding is working fantastically well to stop the panic attacks happening but it's leading to a really restricted life where they can't go and exercise or play football with their mates or go to a film do the other stuff which is really important for their mental health or build relationships because 100 percent of the focus has to be on avoiding the panic attacks Mm -hmm. So what was your, what were some of the other types? Because I know you mentioned social anxiety before. Yeah. <laughs> that's the one That's the one that I feel like it, most yeah. aligns with so, me. Yeah, so I, th- I think social anxiety is something which so many people can connect with. It's mm. this experience of feeling constantly watched, judged, and negatively evaluated by other people. So we might constantly feel like we're the centre of attention or on a, on a stage. And situations where we are the centre of attention can become overwhelmingly unbearably difficult because it feels like people are constantly picking out every move and and judging us and saying really nasty things about us again we we tend to avoid social situations because they make us feel really uncomfortably anxious we get physical symptoms of anxiety so we might get hot flushes we might be have sweaty palms or shaking and then we focus on those physical symptoms think other people are noticing those too and then we rack up this plethora of 
difficult social interactions which haven't gone particularly well because we're focusing on the really difficult stuff and that gives us more evidence that we can't do social situations and people are judging us and it spirals and it spirals and spirals and gets really hard again that's on a spectrum most people have had an experience of being a teenager or older than that presenting hasn't gone particularly well and we feel judging is horrible so stopping us going to work or school or forming social relationships or avoiding parties human connection is one of the most important things in my life and it really gets in the way of that yeah i think when i was younger i didn't know if it was social anxiety or the fact that maybe it's just i mean a lack of confidence walking into certain situations because you know you look around the room you see all these other people and they're thriving i don't know if that's because are they extroverted is it because i'm introverted that type of thing but i feel like off late just especially after the like before pre-pandemic i think i got myself in quite a, a good uh, routine and going to work every day I was interacting with people on the train or well, not interacting I mean I see them but like interacting with people at work and like in around the office and stuff like that and I feel like I was a lot better um, mm. back then 2019 say and like now I go to work like once a week and even like on the way I go in I start feeling like anxious and um, to see some of my family members like I haven't seen maybe in the last couple of months or something. I may speak to them on the phone and it's fine, but to see them in person, now I'm feeling anxious and there's stuff like that, which is like, it plays in your head. And I guess what we were talking about earlier about that whole loop where you try to get rid of the anxiety and it just kind of builds more. It's exactly that, right? And I yeah. noticed it myself. It doesn't stop the judgment. And the other yeah. really interesting thing you said is, is the pandemic, right? So we spent years being told that other people are unsafe. And we should be social distancing and not talk to people. Yeah, 100%. We know anxiety spikes in situations where we don't feel safe and we're in danger. It's our alarm warning system. Coming out of the pandemic, what that's left loads of us with is struggling more in social situations. A spike of anxiety when we are now mashed back into normal life and seeing people. And that anxiety we really is something we really pay attention to. Um, and and it's, it's a really good example you've raised of, of how our social environment can shape the type of anxieties that we might feel. And that's the thing, like, it just kind of feels like it comes out of nowhere. And the other really difficult thing is the stuff we do to cope works incredibly well in the short term. Hmm. So if I feel really anxious about social situations, if I didn't come to this podcast today, I wouldn't have to misspeak. I wouldn't be feeling anxious. It's incredibly effective. It's brilliant. Um, I'd feel a really good sense of relief. It would probably reinforce me avoiding stuff next time. I'd probably be stewing later on about having the boys going feeling really bad. But the reason we're doing the avoidance is because it works. We're not going crazy. It's a really brilliant human response to things. It's really important for us to be able to avoid things. Our flight response, getting away from stuff. The trouble when we get into these cycles of anxiety is it doesn't become a choice anymore. It becomes the only way we can cope with things. And then it's when it starts having an impact because we're not in control of the choice of whether to avoid something or not. We're not just a, a, avoiding the in-between stuff. We're avoiding the really important stuff. So I guess saying that, how could we support somebody with anxiety or an anxiety disorder? Or would that be two different ways of supporting somebody so yes no and possibly so so fundamentally whether someone has a label of anxiety disorder or not doesn't dictate whether they should or can access mental health support so support for someone's mental health could be professional in terms of therapy so group or one-to-one -one therapy or it could be the sorts of coping strategies that we use in day-to-day -day life that we can get better at so some of the stuff we talked about earlier so slowly tolerating more and more of the anxiety so we cut down on the amount of avoidance we're having to do. Mm. So rather than jump right to the top, which is too much, but to do it in really, really small little steps. And actually, that's what a lot of mental health treatment in general and also anxiety treatment comes down to, is breaking the thing we want to get to doing down into really small, manageable steps, doing it a bit at a time, working out tools and techniques to get us over each hurdle, or wrapping that and understanding people's experience and what that means to them. But it's breaking stuff down into small steps and then using lots of really complicated language to say what those steps are. But fundamentally what we're doing is just really small steps towards the goal, the thing we want to be doing. And that's what we guess anxiety doesn't do, is we jump to the worst case scenario. And so we're kind of doing the opposite. We're jumping to these really small little steps. It's the coping strategies we have ourselves. So connecting with other people, watching a film. And then on the other side of the spectrum, we've got the professional support, which looks at one end around information. So stuff like this is a great starting point. Mm. So what is anxiety? What am, am I dealing with? What are the patterns? Where does it come from? And then the professional health and therapy, which is about understanding someone's experience, what's led them to this point, making it make sense for them. 
And I think that's a really important part of the journey that you are reacting as a human, working out the goals. So what, what does this look like at the end? What are we trying to achieve here? If the anxiety wasn't here, what would you be doing differently? And then using a range of different strategies, tools and techniques to help someone get there. So CBT is something which is recommended for lots of anxiety disorders, so cognitive behavioural therapy, but other approaches have been shown to be really effective as well. So although CBT has the most, the biggest evidence base, there's other approaches which we're now seeing come out which are equally as effective. The CBT is the most common one to, to be able to access. Yeah, absolutely. One size does not fit all when it comes to treatment. Well, thank you, Dr. Joe, for this amazing episode. I'm sure somebody will get some amazing information out of it. If somebody wanted to to learn a little bit more about you or get in touch, how could they? Uh, so I have a website, which you can find at Connect Clinical Psychology, which has a mental health article. So I do a blog, <laughs> which I'm trying to do a bit more of, and that has all my contact details on it. Well, thank you so much. It's been a great uh, episode, and I hope you have an amazing day. Likewise, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you, Craig.